Welcome to the third and final module on neuroimaging. Up to now, we've covered how images are acquired, how to interpret basic MRI and CT, and in this third module, we'll be focusing on when to order CT or MRI and understanding the potential risks associated with each of these uh, imaging modalities so you can order them and uh, perform them successfully in your patients. Part three is Organized as follows, we'll first talk about how to decide between performing a CT and an MRI examination. We'll discuss whether or not contrast media should be administered and the, the role of contrast media in imaging uh, the brain. We'll also discuss radiation dose uh, considerations with CT. Radiation has uh, become an important factor considered uh, to be considered when patients are undergoing CT examinations. Finally, we'll also discuss safety considerations with MRI that you should think about before you order an MRI in your patient. First of all, let's cover how to decide between performing a CT and an MRI. This is showing you uh, CT on your left and MRI on your right. There's a number of considerations that have to be borne in mind when uh, wondering which type of study to acquire. Really, it depends on the patient and the patient's uh, circumstances. So it's really up to you and, and to your patient. CT, on the one hand, is much faster than MRI. It can be acquired, as we talked about, in seconds. It's cheaper, cheaper billed to insurance, um, probably cheaper for the patient as well. It's more accessible because it can be performed faster. Uh, many patients can get through a CT scanner very quickly. Virtually every hospital and certainly every emergency room has a CT scanner, whereas MRI remains a, a relatively scarce resource. Um, when I'm thinking about the clinical indications, CT really shows you the bone much better than MRI does. Uh, on the downside of CT, it does incur a radiation dose, although the radiation dose is small, and certain patients can't undergo CT uh, for the desired reason for the study. On the MRI column, you know that MRI is slower. The patient has to lie in the scanner for 30 to 45 minutes. It's certainly more expensive. It's less accessible. Um, but on the upside, it provides a lot of tissue detail that you simply can't see with CT. There is no ionizing radiation dose to the patient. It's a safe uh, modality in that sense. But there are contraindications with MRI as well that you have to bear in mind when deciding between CT and MRI. Let's start with CT. What are the indications? CT is almost always the first modality used in the emergency room when patients present with acute neurologic deficits or trauma. Uh, just because it can be obtained rapidly, uh, it can guide patient management uh, in patients who are often unstable. An example would be subarachnoid hemorrhage when an aneurysm bursts. Uh, you don't have time to wait for an MRI necessarily. Uh, you have to move quickly, obtain a CT, find the aneurysm, and manage the patient appropriately. It's best in the acutely ill or unstable patient. And in certain patients who can't have an MRI, uh, here it says pacemaker, although I'll give a caveat here that some patients with pacemakers can now have MRI. Um, CT is still the preferred modality in certain patients who can't have an MRI scan for whatever reason. There are contraindications to CT. First of all, because it is a ionizing radiation uh, dose modality. Uh, patients who are pregnant should not undergo CT, especially in the first trimester. In the second trimester, it's a risk-benefits discussion. We always ask our patients before they have CT whether or not they're pregnant. You should ask too. Certain ionic uh, contrast media can also cause allergic reactions. These can vary in severity, but certainly if a patient has a prior allergic reaction to contrast, they shouldn't have another exam uh, unless it's absolutely indicated or they're premedicated for their allergic reaction. And then because of radiation concerns, pediatric patients really shouldn't undergo CT as the first-line modality. MRI is probably the best scan in most pediatric cases unless it's an absolute emergency. I like to tell my trainees that there's really three major roles for performing a CT examination. These are patients who are unstable. You have to get an answer quickly. And the really, uh, you can only see three things with great fidelity. Hemorrhage, in this case, you can see a large hemorrhage in the right side of the brain. Hydrocephalus, 
CT really shows the CSF separate from the brain nicely. In this case, you can see the ventricles are enlarged, uh, causing the brain to be compressed around it. And herniation. Herniation is a surgical emergency. The patient can um, move very quickly when the brain is moving across the rigid falks across the brain, so you can damage the brain significantly. And as shown in this example of a patient with a large MCA territory infarction, which has swollen and caused some herniation across the midline. The other thing to keep in mind is when a CT is normal, the patient can still have a significant abnormality. In this case, I'm showing you ventricles that are slightly out of proportion to the sulci. You may be suspect that there's hydrocephalus going on, and indeed there is. How do I know? The ventricles, in this case, are much larger. I don't, then the sulci at the outside of the brain, I'm not seeing the normal interdigitizing sulci that I would see in a patient without hydrocephalus. But in this case, why does the patient have hydrocephalus? To answer that, I really need to go the next step to MRI. Here, I've only detected the hydrocephalus. When we get an MRI, in this case, a post-gadolinium T1-weighted image, what I'm looking at is extensive enhancement within the leptomeningeal spaces around the brain. This is abnormal enhancement. You can see it, these lines throughout the hemisphere. This is acting as um, an obstruction to normal CSF flow. It's blocking the normal flow of CSF through the ventricles and drainage, and so you end up with what's called communicating hydrocephalus. Let's turn to MRI. MRI, the indications, as I mentioned earlier, MRI is the best current technique for evaluating the brain. So certainly if a patient has a uh, abnormality um, or does not have an abnormality on CT and a strong clinical concern remains, the patient should go on to get a MRI. Certain areas of the brain are not very well seen with CT, specifically the bone around the posterior fossa, that's the brain stem and cerebellum, really provides an obstacle for normal imaging of the, the, these structures so that uh, they are much better seen on MRI than CT. And then, as we mentioned before, certain patients may have contraindications to CT, in, especially in pediatric patients where it's best practice to start with an MRI probably. There are contraindications Certain devices, when they're implanted in the body, can be moved by the magnetic field. So it's important to consider whether your patient has an implant. A normal hip prosthesis or knee prosthesis, for example, is not a problem. Uh, however, uh, certain devices, such as old aneurysm clips, um, although not newer ones, older aneurysm clips, metallic fragments in the eye, these sorts of uh, devices uh, can move when placed in an MRI and cause considerable damage. When a patient can't sit still for 30 to 45 minutes, they probably can't have an MRI, so extremely claustrophobic patients um, are not typically eligible for MRI. If you have to give gadolinium, if a patient has renal failure, an MRI should not be performed. And finally, there's some debate in the literature, it's not well shown, but early pregnancy, uh, it's probably best practice not to at least give gadolinium or even do MRI early in pregnancy. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about contrast media. Contrast media um, are injected intravenously and with a CT scan. It's an iodinated contrast agent because iodine is dense and can be seen with a CT scanner. With an MRI scan, the contrast agent is gadolinium. Gadolinium has the effect of shortening T1, so it makes things bright on a T1-weighted MRI. Once it's injected peripherally into the intravenous um, side of the circulation. It will pass to the arterial side of the circulation. Uh, it can pass through different structures and may pass across vessels when there's enough space uh, between, structure, between the um, endothelial cells, such as in the liver or kidney, for example. But in the brain, the blood-brain barrier prevents normal contrast from extending outside of the vessels. So in a normal brain, I only see structures outside of the blood-brain barrier enhance. So typical uh, structures that might enhance uh, include the pituitary gland, which is outside of the blood-brain barrier, the choroids plexus, which is outside of the blood-brain barrier, um, the soft tissues may enhance, but the brain itself does not enhance because of the blood-brain barrier. Uh, 
contrast agent uh, are macromolecules. They don't pass through the tight endothelial junctions around the blood vessels uh, that pass through the brain. Only certain compounds, especially lipophilic compounds, will pass through the blood-brain barrier. Iodinated contrast uh, comes in vials, as you can see on the left. It's injected, and then depending on when I do my imaging, I can see different structures. Early in the injection, I might see the vessels. In this case, I'm showing you two projections of a cerebral angiogram. In this case, I'm able to subtract out the bone, soft tissue structures, and I'm just able to isolate specifically the uh, arterial uh, phase of the image. There's a similar, I could look at the venous phase uh, of this angiogram. This is a catheter angiogram, but with a CT, I can do a similar CT angiogram by injecting contrast as a bolus and a CT venogram in a similar fashion. When I image a little bit later, I'm looking for contrast that is extended outside of a disrupted blood-brain barrier. So the contrast has leaked from the blood pool into the interstitial space or the extracellular space between neurons and glia in the brain. The normal brain should not have uh, contrast enhancement. I can also do contrast injections to uh, assess physiology in the brain using uh, perfusion techniques and similar techniques to look at microvasculature. What does contrast enhancement look like? This patient, I'm showing you on the left, the unenhanced CT. I get an idea that something is wrong when I look for symmetry across the two hemispheres. The left hemisphere, I'm not seeing the normal ventricle. There's abnormal high density and low density around this structure. I can see that there's considerable mass effect related to this lesion. Why? Because I'm not seeing the sulci around this. Not only that, but there's shift of the midline. So the normal midline goes up and down. In this case, there's shift of the midline from the left to the right. I know something is abnormal, but what now I'm not really sure what it is. Is this an infection? Is this a tumor? Is this something else that needs to be treated urgently? In this case, I might want to give contrast. Now the normal enhancing structures, because they're outside of the blood-brain barrier, include the vessels. Here's your sagittal sinus some small arteries within the sylvian fissure. But here, where the arrow is pointing, there is abnormal enhancement. So I know that the contrast that I administered through the vein when I imaged this brain leaked out of the blood vessels into the brain around it, indicating that there's disrupted blood-brain barrier. That helps me to identify uh, different abnormalities and differentiate between them. CT contrast is relatively well t tolerated, um, but there are isolated uh, incidents of allergic reactions in a certain fraction of the population. Usually uh, simple hives or redness in the skin, perhaps some itching. Rarely bronchospasm or laryngospasm or even hemodynamic collapse. With old iodinated contrast agents uh, administered in the 80s and 70s, uh, there were some severe reactions and they were not uncommon. With modern contrast agents in CT, these severe reactions are rare. The incidence is only about 0.004%. Another risk of CT contrast is CT contrast is directly toxic to the kidney. Usually that is a risk when patients have pre-existing renal failure, if they have uh, myeloma or if they're diabetic. True and true acute renal failure from uh, CT contrast is thankfully rare, and the incidence can be reduced by providing the patient oral or intravenous hydration or using a lower risk but higher cost, low osmolality contrast agent. There are a few other risks. Pregnancy is a relative contraindication. As physicians, it's our goal not to radiate fetuses or infants or embryos. And patients who are on metformin, lactic acidosis can result. So we still ask patients if they are on metformin before going a, undergoing a CT with contrast. Now, gadolinium contrast is a little different. It's not iodinated. It's a heavy metal. Uh, it's administered intravenously most of the time, just like iodinated contrast, so through a peripheral IV. It's, gadolinium itself is toxic, uh, so it is chelated to a macromolecule. That means bound to a macromolecule that is, passes through the blood supply and is excreted into the urine. 
Gadolinium increases signal on the MRI by causing T1 relaxation so that things that enhance are brighter on a T1 weighted image. The image on your right is a gadolinium enhanced dynamic MR angiogram in which we saw the bolus of the contrast come up, go through the arterial side, uh, end up in the venous circulation, and then pass down into the neck. With gadolinium contrast, allergic reactions are especially rare. There is one notable risk of gadolinium that needs to be borne in mind. This occurs in patients with a GFR or a estimated glomerular filtration rate of less than 30. Patients with this renal condition or renal insufficiency may develop an unusual systemic fibrotic reaction as shown in this patient to gadolinium called nephrogenic systemic fibrosis or NSF. This is really a disease uh, isolated to the administration of gadolinium. It's uncommon, but we uh, are very reluctant to administer contrast in patients with a GFR less than 30 because of the possibility of this complication. The risk of developing NSF in a patient with a GFR of less than 30 is higher in those patients who have acute as opposed to chronic renal failure and those patients who have ongoing inflammation such as a deep venous thrombosis or recent surgery. Let's talk a little bit about radiation and CT since uh, that's something you want to think about in your patients undergoing CT scans. This is especially important as if we look over time you can see that the uh, number of CT scans being performed has dramatically increased from 1980 through 2005. It's uh, now on the order of 60 to 80 million even now uh, per year. So medical radiation is now one of the largest causes of radiation dosed to the general public. What are the effects of radiation on your patient? There are two separate effects. We usually think of deterministic effects as being um, uh, less common but more severe. These are effects in which if a certain threshold dose is exceeded, if the dose from the CT scan, for example, or the dose from an angiogram exceeds a, a fixed number, these deterministic effects are more common. They happen early. They may be skin burns. They may be hairlines. Even cataracts can perform. They become more and more common and more and more severe with the higher the dose. These are very, very uncommon with CT. You can see this article from the New York Times in 2010 gave press to this using a technique called CT perfusion in which a small area of the head is imaged over and over and over again in order to study how the contrast passes through from one side of the circulation to the other. Uh, in this case, the uh, parameters that were initially used in some of these examinations were dialed up or they were the radiation dose was set too high so that nicer images resulted, but in this case you can see hair loss also resulted. Deterministic effects with radiation are very rare and we don't see them uh, nowadays, especially with uh, dose reduction technology that we use. We do worry a little bit more about stochastic effects. These are cumulative effects of radiation over time. Um, so when you think about time, these are certainly more important uh, to think about in kids who have a lifetime of potential exposure to radiation, including CT. There's no threshold for the dose required to achieve a stochastic uh, lesion with radiation. They tend to occur late, so uh, many, many years after radiation is uh, administered. This diagram on your bottom right is showing you the idea of how ionizing radiation affects the body. The ionizing radiation displaces electrons, which ultimately creates free radicals and can break DNA. When DNA is broken, you can end up with carcinogenesis and germline mutations, which ultimately may give rise to cancer. Thankfully, these are exceptionally uncommon. It's tough to study this material because the, the risk is so low and it occurs with such infrequency that it's, it's difficult to provide uh, exact estimates of what the risk is for a sto stochastic uh, lesion with radiation. But the risk is, is definitely low. How do we estimate the stochastic risk uh, to a patient? Really the only model we have to estimate how much radiation is required uh, to induce cancer is what's called the linear no threshold model. This data is problematic because it's extrapolated from atomic bomb data. This is probably um, a conservative estimate, so this is uh, very um, 
unlikely, but uh, the estimated risk of a fatal cancer would be about 1 in 2,000 after a radiation dose of 10 millisieverts. 10 millisieverts, a relatively high dose, um, certainly higher than a standard head CT and most abdominal CTs. But it's important to have some numbers in mind. This is a conservative estimate, but it's, it's very controversial, um, but that's the, the risk. How much radiation is uh, incurred in a head CT? Now, this is a good number to uh, get in your head, keep in mind for your patients when they ask. The estimated dose from a head CT is two millisieverts, and nowadays probably less using dose reduction technology. Now, what does that mean to the average patient? Also, it's important to give an idea of you know, what your natural exposure to radiation is. Just by living at certain altitudes or by exposure to the sun and natural radon gas, uh, your estimated dose is about three millisieverts per year. So one way of looking at a head CT is about a year's worth of radiation dose, probably less, probably half a year. By flying on a flight across continents, uh, it has a higher dose of radiation as well. Chest x-ray, very low dose. CT angiography, higher dose, um, relatively higher dose. But let's not forget, you know, this radiation, uh, I think it's important for everyone to think about radiation and understand radiation. But don't forget, CT scanning has saved millions of lives, literally millions of lives. It's replaced exploratory surgery. For example, appendicitis no longer is treated uh, surgically unless the CT scan is abnormal. That saved a lot of surgical lives. Nonetheless, I'd encourage you to keep in mind that CT should really only be ordered if it makes sense. So think very carefully and also think about the cumulative dose to patients, especially pediatric patients. Let's end by talking about some of the safety considerations with MRI. This is a fun topic because you're talking about a giant magnet and people have fun with giant magnets. How strong is this magnet? 600 times as strong as your typical refrigerator magnet. That's for a one and a half Tesla scanner. For a three Tesla scanner, it's twice as strong as that, so it's 1,200 times as strong as a refrigerator magnet. It's about 60,000 times the Earth's magnetic field, and it's important to keep in mind, you can't turn this off. The superconductor inside the magnet is always on. The magnetic field is always on whether or not a patient is in the scanner or not. So we think a lot about um, MR safety uh, around the MR scanners, and there's a lot of uh, incidents that have occurred when these uh, when protocols are violated. If you go to get an MRI scan, you'll see it, the scanner is behind closed doors. Here at UCSF, there's a sign on the outside that says, do not enter, the magnet is always on. This is, when I pass through the doors, you can see a series of doors that I have to pass through and ultimately to go in the scan room and at, at each point there's a check. But please keep in mind, always on your mind, about the MR scanner being on. This is a demonstration of what happens when you bring an oxygen tank, a metallic oxygen tank, too close to a scanner. A group in Sweden uh, put this together and a scanner that they really didn't care much about anymore because it had met its lifespan. Large oxygen tank relatively close to the scanner. There's a, there's a watermelon on the inside of a head coil and moving the tank close to the coil now pretend the watermelon is a patient's head. You can see there's a problem here. Tank flies into the scanner and ultimately uh, there's considerable injury to the watermelon or in the case of a patient, uh, to the patient themselves. Now, over the years, um, people forget that MRI scanners are always on, and so various things have flown into the magnet. Makes for great pictures, uh, whether it be floor cleaners or hospital beds or wheelchairs or office chairs. Um, this is, an, unfortunately, this happens not infrequently. In this case, it's virtually impossible to pull these things out of the magnet. Uh, it's very bad when a patient's inside of the scanner and uh, there's certainly been major injuries to patients um, when they are in the scanner and a metal object is brought close to the scanner. So let's end with a question. The typical radiation dose to a patient with a head CT is on the order of 
A, 2 millisieverts, B, 10 millisieverts, C, 20 millisieverts, D, 200 millisieverts, or E, 2,000 millisieverts? The answer is 2 millisieverts, usually about 6 months' worth of background radiation dose. So summarizing, risks and benefits of imaging. Um, many factors have to be considered when choosing the appropriate test for your patient. First and foremost, think of the patient, their ability to tolerate the imaging examination and the clinical context in which you are performing the examination. CT is by far the best examination for bone, but if you want to look at the brain, CT is a screening examination and MRI is much better. It's the current gold standard. There is a radiation dose with CT. It's usually on the order of less than 2 millisieverts for head CT. Certain exams have a much higher dose, up to 20 millisieverts. The primary risk of CT contrast is nephrotoxicity or injury to the kidneys. And finally, the primary risk of MRI contrast in those patients with a low GFR or acute renal failure is nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. Thanks for listening. This concludes our three modules on neuroimaging. I hope you found them useful.